Hey everybody, it's Dr. Rick here, dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having a great start to your weekend. Look, uh, if you missed the second installment on my series on uh, black wealth and the wealth gap, black uh, uh, financial crisis, um, definitely go back and check out the video from today. What I'm doing is, as I'm closing out my 25th book, which is The War on Black Wealth, uh, Chasing the American Dream, I'm just looking at all of the things that are literally happening right now. We have, you know, everything from reconstruction, black codes, convict leasing, redlining, benign neglect, urban renewal, all these different things that had a negative impact on black wealth. But um, it's so much more. So if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Also, as always, we need your support. Support the work we're doing. Black men lead the work we're doing in the community with young black uh, girls and young black females dealing with uh, childhood sexual abuse, domestic abuse, and so much more. Uh, dealing with uh, the struggle of black men and mental health. All these different things are things that we are confronting and have been confronting for years. Black Men Lead is a rite of passage initiative uh, designed to socialize young black males into black manhood. It is absolutely necessary because we're failing on in that particular uh, responsibility in an unbelievably horrible way. So we need your support. What I want to talk to you about now is overall community response. Oh, and don't forget, if you are interested in getting a signed copy of the book, which drops at the end of the month, the link is in the description box. And also, I have decided that I will extend the opportunity for people who want to do tributes in the book. I did that at the beginning of the year. Uh, and I'll have a write-up of how you can do that, but you can literally... Uh, those people who contribute uh, to Black Man Lead uh, will get uh, to send in um, a, an attribution or play tribute to somebody. It could be your parents, your mentor, it could be yourself, something you've accomplished, you're excited about, but you'll be able to do that. And I'm going to do that until the book actually goes to print. And I'll, I'll have that also in the description box. What I want to talk to you now is why black men lead is so important. There are so many different things that I've covered over the years from economic crisis, the wealth gap to the mis, uh, my 16th book, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America to what I called uh, collective cognitive bias uh, syndrome, uh, which I brought out and broke out in Born in Captivity, Psychopathologies, a Legacy of Slavery. I've dealt with uh, multi-generational uh, transmission of trauma, uh, the, the epigenetic connection, uh, did that, have literally traveled and lectured outside of the United States on epigenetics. Um, I have touched so many different things, but let me explain something to you. Any movement has to have momentum. You want elevation, but you also need momentum. And one of the things that we are finding now is that we don't have the connectivity between black men and black women to create that. Uh, I have always said that we will only get as high and elevated as our women can spiritually lift us. That's their strength, that's their power. That's what they are designed to do, is to provide the elevation. But we will never get any further than our men can literally physically lead us. Leading isn't saying I'm a leader. Leader is being out front paving the path. Leading is creating the environment for those who you cover to be comfortable and secure in doing what they are designed to do. Leading is setting an example for those that follow so they can come along and actually do it better than you. Mentoring, pouring into. And when I initially uh, designed the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage initiative. It was primarily focused on reducing violence in the black community among young black males. 
Um, it was on the heels of the research of dealing with the myth of black on black crime and why it, it, it's not a reality until we start talking about white on white crime and all others because 84% uh, of white people are murdered by other white people. It's a proximal thing. So um, we dealt with all of that. But when I originally did this, my focus was on wondering if we could predict uh, the risk of any one child committing violence. Found out we could. Uh, work from Dr. Howard Stevenson, Dr. Joy DeGruy, most famously known for her work on post-traumatic slave syndrome, which I also researched in studying uh, multi-generational uh, transmission of trauma. But uh, in connecting with those two, come to find out that there are direct uh, attrib uh, attrib attributions or contributors to the proclivity for violence that can be used to predict. Matter of fact, Dr. DeGruy created the first African-American adolescent uh, respect scale. Why? Because we found out the feeling of being disrespected was the number one catalyst for violence among young black males. Uh, the number two uh, catalyst was the lack of proper racial socialization. So in essence, not proper being not properly not being properly socialized means that you're not prepared or socially aware. I'm excuse me, I'm I'm up here uh got actually meeting a kid to mentor a kid at the cigarette shop. I'm calling my kid, he's twenty eight. But uh to to so I'm meeting him up here. So I'm gonna hurry up and finish this. Look. So what we found is you have these five primary factors. Number one a kid feels disrespected uh, you go to prison and it's lined with people who have harmed or killed people because in some way they interpreted what was done as disrespect number two is the lack of proper racial socialization I'm going to come back to that number three is being a witness uh, to violence and we all know if you grew up in the hood you've seen violent acts uh, being a victim of violence uh, there's a good chance if you grew up in the hood that you have at some point been a victim of violence. You may even be in a home where you are consistently uh, victimized in a violent way. Number five is urban hassle. What is urban hassle? Urban hassle is the things that you experience in the inner city that are just common to it. Sirens all time of the night, gunfire all time of the night, navigating through gang violence to get to school and get home, navigating through drug use to get to school and get home, um, overcrowdedness. Um, if you're on the East Coast or in the Midwest, L trains, uh, which are extremely loud, just the noise pollution. All of these things come together to put a young black male on edge. It contributes to the proclivity for their risk to commit violence. All of this comes from tons and tons of empirical data that has been broken down so that we can understand that. I have spent years trying to understand it because my goal was to reduce, uh, reduce violence on young black males. Not only... When I created the program, not only did I discover that it reduces violence, it also does a couple of other things. It increases the chances of uh, completing school, which means that you get a diploma, which first and foremost advances you and gives you a better chance to move into the next level of whatever that is, whether it's developing a hand skill or developing a professional skill to make a living to where you can support a family, which is extremely important for manhood. Uh, number two, uh, in, in, in completing school, you're, you're not a dropout. So it reduces the dropout rate. Why is that important? Because kids who drop out, uh, black, uh, males who drop out of school are five times more likely to become criminal minded and end up incarcerated. It also increases the chance of becoming a business owner. Amazing some of the things that we've gotten out of this program because it's one of the principles we teach. Ownership is a responsibility. Um, Business ownership is a responsibility. Being able to pass something on to your progeny that is connected to their ability to survive and thrive and live in life is a responsibility. It's not an option. It's not a fantasy. It's a responsibility and it's possible. And we teach them the possibilities. The number one rule, the number one rule, there are 11 principles, the number one principle in the uh, 
program is that a black man never brings harm or causes harm in any way to a black woman. And then we move on down from there with others that I've discussed and more. It's important because we can't move our, our, our momentum forward without strong black men. We can't move our momentum forward. It doesn't matter how many black men have the bag. That doesn't make you a strong man. That's one of the weakest ideals and definitions of manhood is anybody with a creative mind or a hustle to grind can get the bag. Doesn't make them a man. Some of my best grinders that I've ever came across and that I respect are female. Doesn't mean that they are man. They got the bag. Doesn't make them a man. So anything that can be done by a woman doesn't qualify you as a man. So having the bag doesn't make you a man. What makes you a man? What makes you a man, number one, is you create an environment around you where people thrive. You create an environment around you where people rise and become what they're capable of becoming. You create an environment around you where people respect you and operate in an environment of safety that allows them to do things that they cannot do outside of your space. In other words, you literally elevate everyone around you. You literally put everyone around you in a place where they feel safe. You cannot be a man if you're the feared person. Not by the people you're supposed to be protecting. The enemy should fear you. Anybody trying to harm the people that you are supposed to be covering should fear you, but not the people you're covering. They should never fear you. They should feel safe. They should want to be underneath your wing. They should want to be underneath the covering that you provide. And we have to start teaching this to young black males early because what happens is with you got five, 1.5 million black men missing. So you got this big gap. What does that mean? That there's a large number of children who aren't seeing manhood modeled enough to emulate it. That's the most powerful way you teach is by them observing you. How do you treat your wife? How do you treat your children? How do you respond to frustration? How do you respond when you're angry? How do you respond to difficult moments? Do you fold? Do you stand up? Do you connect? Do you have friends? Is that someone you call? All of these things are people are things that a kid would normally be able to observe if dad was in the home. Well, in many instances, dad is in the home. Seventy-five percent of kids are being are being of black kids are being born in a single parent house. Households. So what does that mean? They're going to have to find this modeling someone else. Mom can talk about what they what she feels he should do. Mom can sit up and talk about what she would want in a man. Mom can sit up and talk about all the things that are desirable in a man, but that doesn't teach him how to be a man because the vast majority of what he's going to do is going to be what he assimilates, what he sees, what he what he what he does. And then if he doesn't get it, what's going to happen is he's going to go out and then he's going to enter a point in time where the testosterone level testosterone level go up. So it's going to become more aggressive. He's going to become stronger and he's going to need a place to put that. And he's going to be frustrated because he's not going to feel he has a place in the world because everywhere he goes doesn't want him there. School starts trying to alienate him as early as five years old. Oppositional defiance oppositional defiant disorder uh, ADHD and everything else that is trying to stick a tag on him put him in special education at a disproportionate level so that they can get him out of the classroom and put him away so they don't have to deal with him and ultimately ends up leading to him in many instances dropping out of school and I just told you what happens when he drops out when he drops out he is more five times more likely to end up incarcerated. So it's our responsibility to find ways to socialize these young black men. I am a firm believer that we need a universal rite of passage. The Jews have the bar mitzvah and, 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 and Latinos have their rite of passage. Arabs have their rite of passage. We're the only ones who don't have a universal rite of passage, which teaches the young black male who they're supposed to be gets them to a po certain point lets them celebrate the beginning of their journey and then starts them into the process of responsibility this is so important to the socialization of the young mind and having him ready to be able to do what he's going to be called on to do in the black community in 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 in, in, in the responsibilities for his finance and responsibilities for his protecting and the funds the responsibilities for his leading and in coming together and creating strategies and agenda he has a responsibility that he has to be prepared for if we're going to elevate we have a long way to go what i am saying is we need to start doing better 
uh, I get a lot of calls, young black men, uh, males struggling with mental health. Why? Because nobody's there, and that 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 stigma that floats around mental health is really heavy on black males. The older men don't want to do it. Now the young cats definitely don't want to do it. But what's happening? They're killing people and killing themselves at an alarming rate. We up to almost 49 percent increase in the last six years of young black males killing themselves between the ages of 14 and 24. 49 percent increase. That's on us. We've got to do better. There's also an increase in intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide. In other words, the very people that are supposed to be protecting, they're harming. There's a problem in that. We need to do the work. So again, I'm calling on you guys to support this. What I want to do is create a national network. What I would like to do is literally set up a 15 to 20 city tour for the first year and literally go around and teach the people in those communities how to execute the program, how to engage these young boys, how to literally deal with kids who have a proclivity towards violence and be safe and yet be forceful in their lives. There's a way to do it. I've been doing it. Um, and while I'm capable of getting rowdy and doing what I gotta do, I've never been called, I have never been put in a situation where I've had to. The crazy thing is, this is something that we discovered. We discovered that once a young African-American male gets angry, there's very little you can do to start to stem that anger initially. But what we did find is just the simple touch of an elder, a man that he had, holds in high regard, just the touch, hand on the shoulder, stops the physical aggression. This is powerful. We need to learn this. We need to do just touching from someone that it's not taken as aggression. It's not taken as a threat. It's immediately interpreted as what? Love. Something they haven't gotten. I want this to be universal. The link to support the work we're doing is in the box. Also, keep in mind, until uh, the War on Black Wealth actually goes to print, anybody who donates will be able to send in um, a three to four uh, sentence paragraph paying tribute to someone. And uh, it will be in the book, in the front of the book. Uh, the name of the person you're paying tribute to and their their, their attribution. So uh, right now we've probably gotten 20 or 30 people who, who did it when I first offered it and then uh, I backed off of it. But as we close out, I'm going to open it back up and, and I'm not going to connect it to anybody having to pay anything to do it. What I'm going to connect it to is if you support Black Man Lead in any way, I'm going to be contacting you for you to send me what you want in the book and I'm going to make sure it's in there. On that note, I got to get out because I got to get in here. Uh, and meet with this young man. Uh, he's from Chicago. Kid has an unbelievable head on his shoulder, but has nobody there to help him put it together. And we need to do more of that. And so for everybody who thinks that, I don't. I do this all the time. I've got plenty of people that I'm pouring into that I don't charge. Uh, so on that note, I'm out of here. You guys, I hope that you will support what we're doing. I'm out.